This is rather exciting to be at a point now in our discussion about polynomials where we can focus more on the middle parts of the graphs. Up until now, we've talked a lot about end behavior, so we know what the ends of a polynomial function could do, one of the four possibilities I'm quickly sketching here. But our emphasis in this video and the next video and really the days to come will be, what about what's happening in between those ends? How do we fill in the blank of the function's behavior? So our discussion today will gear more towards that middle of the graph behavior. It's pretty interesting. So let's start by just talking through some characteristics, which I've already written out, but we'll talk through one by one here, uh, just to help us get familiar with polynomial graphs. One important thing is that graphs of polyno polynomial functions are smooth and continuous. So they don't have breaks in them. That means if I were to draw one, I could draw one without ever lifting my pen off the page. So um, they're not made up of multiple pieces or anything like that. I know we've looked at piecewise functions together. Polynomial functions are not that way. So they are one continuous piece. Another important thing is when we talk about polynomial functions, they have something called turning points. Turning points, kind of like the name implies, is a location on the graph where the, the curve changes from either increasing to decreasing or decreasing to increasing. Even just with this little blip of a polynomial function I've drawn, you can tell um, that for a little bit, this polynomial function increases, and then you can tell it switches to decreasing. So we would call this point right in between a turning point. Then after decreasing, it again switches back to increasing. So this little example has a second turning point. Interestingly, if the degree of the polynomial is n, there will be at most n minus 1 turning points. So just to challenge you with our knowledge of polynomial n behavior, what would the end behavior what would the um, end behavior of this little example right here tell me about the degree of the polynomial since the ends are doing different things I know it must be an odd degree right and then we could even break down further right uh, whether it was a positive or a negative leading coefficient but if the degree is odd, I'm going to guess that the degree of this is likely 3, because if it was degree 1, it would just be a straight line. So that means the number of turning points will be at most 1 less than 3. So if it's a degree 3, it could have at most 1 less than 3 or 2 turning points. And that's, in fact, what we just located here on this very small example. So if uh, you're familiar with the word vertex from a quadratic, that's the turning point for a quadratic function. Let's talk a little bit more. I have a better example of what we were just talking about ready to go here. How many turning points can you locate in the polynomial graph shown? I'm guessing you said three. Good. So there are three turning points shown in red for the function graphed on the screen. Perfect. And just to kind of reflect back again on this idea of end behavior, what can you tell from this graph based on the end behavior? What can we say about the degree? What can we say about the leading coefficient? Take a quick moment and think about whether this function must be an odd or even degree. Then take a moment and consider if the leading coefficient must be positive or negative. Make sure you think through this and then I'll share a response. Okay, hopefully your thoughts are similar to the ones showing on the screen now. Based on the end behavior, we can say that this must be an even degree polynomial. Uh, the reason we can say that is both ends do the same thing. So we know in an even polynomial, even degree polynomial, both ends do the same thing. Because both ends point down, we're even able to say a little more. We can say the leading coefficient must be negative. So that's just to pull back what we did in the previous, um, con the previous day's work. Hopefully those ideas still make some sense.
That means it's time to introduce yet another idea into our discussion. So we're slowly but surely looking at different important characteristics of polynomials. So here's a new concept, and we'll walk through this piece by piece. Feel free to take some time and jot this down as well. So if f is a polynomial function, so we'll work with function f, the values of x for which f of x equals 0 are called the zeros of f. This is a word we're going to use very frequently in the coming days. You technically have already studied zeros of functions a little bit because in the past we would have called these simply the x-intercepts. So I guarantee you that graphically you are already familiar with zeros. We're just going to start calling them the zeros of the function rather than the x-intercepts. Interestingly, a polynomial of degree n will have at most n x-intercepts or zeros. And again, that's probably something you already had some understanding of from the past. For example, we knew an x-squared graph would pass through the x-axis at most twice, and we knew that because of the degree of the polynomial. I'll go ahead and share another example. So here's a function on the screen now, and this graph shows three zeros. It doesn't mean necessarily that the function which is sketched is degree three, but it has at least three what we call real zeros, zeros that we can see on the coordinate plane when we graph. So zeros, as we would have called them in the past, are truly just where we're crossing the x-axis. Our study in the coming days will be how do we locate those points algebraically? And in fact, algebraically is what we'll focus on for the remainder of today's video. So let's go ahead and dive right into an example of finding the zeros of a function algebraically. Our first example will be to find all zeros of the polynomial function given by f of x equals the quantity x plus 1 times the quantity x minus 2 times the quantity x minus 5. So this polynomial is already in factored form, which is kind of rare, but it's a great starting place for our understanding. Because in the previous definition, we saw that the way we find zeros is by setting the function equal to 0. So let's go ahead and talk through that step together. So to find the zeros we set the function equal to 0. Because on the x-axis, the y value is 0. So in this example, that means we have 0 equaling x plus 1 times x minus 2 times x minus 5. When we have a product set to 0, that means we need to simply investigate each piece of the product set to 0. So we'll end up with three linear factors, which are pretty easy to solve. So we find that either x is equal to negative 1, or x is equal to 2, or x is equal to 5. These are the zeros of the polynomial function we were given. Said another way, these are where the x-intercepts are. So let's just um, write this up so we get used to the wording. Um, so I'm going to say the zeros are... And an acceptable way to write this are just to list them out. x equals negative 1, x equals 2, x equals 5. To continue connecting this to what you guys already know from the past, I'm just going to add on set another way. This means the x-intercepts could be listed out as ordered pairs. Because what's true of an x-intercept is that y is 0. So we've really got negative 1, 0 as a point on this function, 2, 0, and 5, 0. I'm going to just quickly sketch this in Desmos and paste a picture of the graph here, just so we continue building that connection between the algebra uh, and the more graphical approach. So that graph is just going to show these are the three locations where the graph will cross the x-axis. I'll be right back with that picture. All right, due to the great convenience of Desmos, I've just graphed the function we were given. 
and you can see the, the three solutions we found, or the three zeros we found, are in fact um, those points at negative one zero, so x equals negative one was one of the zeros. Um, at two zero we can see x equals two was another zero, and then at five comma zero we can see x equals five was the third zero. Cool. And in this example, how do we feel about three zeros? It seems pretty good, right? Because we began with a polynomial function. If we had taken the time to FOIL all this up, um, which we didn't, we didn't need to, we would have had a highest degree as x cubed. I'll leave it to you to verify that if you think that sounds interesting. Let's just try one more example. So let's take this as... Again, our last example for now, we'll, we'll find the zeros in this video and then we'll expound upon their meaning in the next video. This time we gotta find all zeros for f of x equals x to the sixth minus three x to the fourth plus two x squared. I think you'll feel very quickly how different this function feels from our last example. In the last example, the function was given in a already factored form and that helped us tremendously. But our same starting point of setting the function to zero is still true. So let's begin that way. So to find zeros, we set the function equal to zero. And when we do that in this example, that means we arrive at the equation zero equals x to the sixth minus three x to the fourth plus two x squared. Now, we don't have a product equaling zero, so I can't just simply let each piece of the product uh, be set to zero like the last one. So let's pull some factoring skills back up. Let's see if we can try to factor a bit. We'd love to have this equation involve a product of factors because then we know how to solve. So if you notice, all three terms on the right-hand side of the equation have a greatest common factor. If I ask myself between x to the sixth, three, negative three x to the fourth, and two x squared, what's common between those three terms? No numerical value is common other than one, but I notice that all of them have at least two x terms. So that means x squared is what we would call the greatest common factor between those three terms. So we simply remove the common factor of x squared and ask ourselves what remains. So if I took two x's from x to the sixth, I still have four, so the first term would be x to the fourth. If I took two x's from three x to the fourth, I'd still have three and two of the x's. And factoring out an x squared from two x squared leaves just two. So if you feel a little unsure about the factoring step I just took, feel free to check by distributing the x squared back into these three terms, and you'll arrive at the top of the line above. So feel free to check in that way. Now, I'm still not in fully factored form, so I'd like to contemplate a little bit more if I can continue factoring, um, specifically this inner trinomial. So I look at this x to the fourth term, and I notice x to the fourth comes from x squared times x squared. So now I'm curious if I can find, are there two numbers that multiply to the two at the end while also adding to the negative three in the middle? So factors of positive two could be either one times two or negative one times negative two. And we see that the second pair there would also sum to negative three. So I can write this as x squared minus one, x squared minus two. So we're doing a little bit of factoring. Now we have a product of terms set equal to zero. So we're really in the same position we were in the last example to begin with. I can simply grab each piece of this product and set it to zero. Then I'll need to solve the resulting equations of which each of them are quadratic in nature. So I'm gonna do the square root property, which means I want to get the x squared terms isolated, and then I'll just square root both sides. So I'm kind of solving three equations at the same time here on the screen. Um, we'll just finish each of them out and see what they give us. So if I start by square rooting the x squared equals zero equation, 
Well, the square root of 0 is 0, so this first piece gives back just x equals 0. If we square root the equation x squared equals 1, now we'll get back x equals plus or minus 1. So notice that we need to include the plus or minus because 1 times 1 is 1. Negative 1 times negative 1 is also 1. And last but not least, if we square root the x squared equals 2 equation, we'll get back x equals, and we need plus or minus, and the square root of 2 doesn't simplify. So these are the zeros of this polynomial function. Something a little different is happening um, in this one, which we'll address in the next video. So at least we know these are the zeros. If you were to graph it, you would see these all pop up. So let's call it good for there, and we'll pick by, back up shortly.